All right, uh, welcome everybody to uh, Lions Roar Dharma Center. Um, we're gonna get started with uh, opening prayers and we'll start first with the uh, seven line prayer to Guru Rinpoche. All right. 
Chamsa Ema Gesa Dongpo La Yasen Chogi No Du Ema Teacher, bow destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, bow destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, bow destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, bow destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, O destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, O destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and said, Supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with supreme marks, a face like a stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of an ocean like merits of good qualities, to thus gone, my prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, released from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that bridges peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, while abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms and atoms in all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp. Illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. 
May all sentient beings have happiness in the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. The offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with the pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my edams, and the three precious jewels, I offer to all you with unwavering faith. Accept these out of your boundless compassion. Please send down waves of inspiring blessings. Edam guru ratnam amelakam niratayani. All right, the heart of the perfection of wisdom sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagawan who was dwelling on mass vultures of the mountain in Rajgira together with a community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration of the category of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice found perfection of wisdom, held the five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra and the Bodhisattva, Masafa, Arya, Avalokiteshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, said this to the venerable Sharivati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding the five aggregates as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, objects of touch and no phenomena. There is no eye element and so on up to and including no mind element, no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance and so on up and to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell on the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration, without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifest completely awakened to the unsurpassed, perfect, complete enlightenment, reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, a mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth. So this is not false. The mantra, the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata, gata, gata, paragata, parasangata, bodhisaha. So now we'll say the mantra 21 times on our own.
Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, she trained in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from the concentration and commended the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage, is like that, is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you've indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivadiputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding and there in Riti, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandavars, are joy and highly praised as spoken by the Bhagavan. All right, now um, we're going to have our talk today by Patty. And uh, in honor of uh, Sakidawa, she's going to give a um, talk on the meaning. Oh, th thank you so much. Let's see. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> No. Okay. All right. So, so can everybody hear me he here? Okay. So, uh, so I, th I thought um, before I give my talk, uh, maybe we could uh, meditate for like just like six minutes. Is that all right with everyone here? Okay. Thanks for everybody who's joined me online as well. I can't see you, but I know you're there. If you have any questions at the end, um, somebody here will let me know.
So welcome everybody. And um, everyone here knows me, I'm Patty, but I'm not sure online are there new friends or, oh goodness, we have a little group going. <laughs> so um, my talk today, um, I didn't, I don't like to make excuses, but I think I need to <laughs> because I, um, I'm, I'm very reliable substitute. <laughs> so, but um, like I was mentioning to the people present here, you know, we all need to be able to be, have, be able to count on each other, you know, and um, so sometimes we can't for all sorts of reasons, and then we can help each other. And, um, and then I reminded myself that it's not about perfection at all. And if I say that to other people, it won't mean anything if I think I have to be perfect. So it's about transparency. So, and in the spirit of transparency, I don't feel qualified, but um, I am part of a great lineage. And I have Samaya with my teacher. So I'm, I'm not qualified because I'm, I'm not in a certain sense, I'm not a scholar, but I've been given permission to be here. So that makes it okay. So thank you. I just wanted to say those couple things. And so this month, um, some of you know, and some of you may not know, because um, I'm just a, a beginner in a certain way, even though I've been doing this for a while. But this month is considered uh, very special. Um, this month, we celebrate Buddha's um, and, uh, birth, and we celebrate his enlightenment, and we celebrate his parinirvana or his death. And we do all that in one month, which is so incredible. And um, because uh, I didn't have a lot of time to think about what the talk should be, but when I um, think about it, it it's kind of obvious. This is, uh, we reflect on uh, Shakyamuni Buddha. And so um, next week will be a very special uh, weekend because we're gonna, um, my, my dear friend, uh, Autumn Payne and uh, Susan Farrar was is helping as well. We're gonna have a celebration of Buddha's birthday. And it's for the whole family, but that'll come later. They'll they'll give some announcements towards the end. But for today's purposes, I I thought um, first of all to tell you that uh, a little bit about yesterday. I I went to another center. It's called the Bajayana Center. That I've never been there before, and um, I went there. Uh, I haven't done too much the past couple of years because of COVID. I stay close to home, but I went there, and the teacher there, his name is Sonam Rinpoche. And, um, and he sat just like I am, but a little higher, of course, because he's, uh, he's a, a Rinpoche. So of course he sat higher, but he was talking. Uh, when, what I noticed about him was that he was quite frail and, um, and outwardly, but not inwardly at all. And he was shaking a little bit, but he was okay with it. He was completely present and he was okay to shake. He was just okay to just be whatever he was in the moment. He was okay to just, just be what I saw as pure love. Like when I showed up, he looked at me with recognition, but then I felt kind of good about it. And then I recognized, I saw he did it with everyone. <laughs> you know, just, he was just looking at each person like, oh, you've come, he, every single one. It wasn't a big crowd, but everybody there was made to feel like they were welcome and that they were supposed to be there on that day. So, um, and I learned from him, like what I said before about, uh, he said, very words I told you. He said, I have Samaya with my teacher. And then Rinpoche said, I am part of a, I'm not great, but I'm part of a lineage. But he was great. He was great. But I thought those words fit me today. So um, anyway, so I thought today uh, that it, a book that has been recommended to a lot of us, I have actually not read this book in so long because um, I've, I'm pretty busy with my career as a speech therapist and also with this place and also just with family, like everybody here, we're trying to do everything. So, but the book is called Old Path White Clouds and it's written um, by a, a, a master uh, named Thich Nhat Hanh. And Thich Nhat Hanh went through many things in his life. And in, in the midst of all that, he managed to write this book and a million other books. <laughs> if you just look up his name, you'll see one book after another is so incredible what some people can do who face the most hardest things that are unimaginable. You see Vietnamese and he went through the war and in the midst of all that, he helped people in the midst of all that. And that's what I've noticed with these great people that in the midst of their great suffering, they reach out 
they don't retreat. They, they see what others need and they're continuously giving and giving like that, but not in a, not in a, um, but in the most healthiest of ways because they have it to give because they're in touch with what is in all of us, our, their Buddha nature. So anyway, so this book is really hard to pick because every chapter is so beautiful and I would choose one and then I'd be like, well, what about this one? <laughs> and so um, I don't want to uh, give too much commentary on such beautiful words because it would detract from these beautiful words. But uh, I hope others will enjoy the chapters I've chosen. And then maybe when you're on your own, if you don't have this book, Old Path, White Clouds, you could get it for yourself and just read the whole thing at your leisure. And, and I think you would really, uh, would really enjoy it like I have. So um, like I said, uh, um, this coming weekend, we're celebrating uh, the Buddha's birth. But uh, I was at first going to choose that particular story. And then I got, then I found stories about about just the type of person, the type of human being that Siddhartha was. That was his name as a prince, Siddhartha. Uh, even, even now, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, so maybe, uh, maybe Susan, you can help me. Siddhartha Gautama, is that how you say it? Okay, so I, I, I don't have Indian friends here, so we're gonna have to count on Susan and me. <laughs> so um, anyway, so, uh, so I, I, I found stories that made me, that kind of touched me, but I think, if I kept going, I would never make a decision. So I had to make a decision. So this is chapter three in this book. And um, before I begin, is there any, anybody have a question for me before, from what I, I just said? I probably haven't said too much, but okay. All right. So, so this story, so the, why I like this book is because it shows how Buddha started out like, like us, but not like us, of course. I mean, he's the, just an incredible being but at the same time he wanted us to get in touch with what's in us that's what's in him that was his whole motivation so here's how it goes before falling asleep Savasti sat beneath a bamboo tree and recalled the months he had first met the buddha he was just 11 years old then and his mother had recently died leaving him in charge of his three younger siblings his youngest sister an infant had no milk to drink Luckily, a man in the village named Rambul hired Sebasti to tend his water buffaloes, four grown buffaloes and one calf. And so Sebasti was able to milk a buffalo cow every day and feed his baby sister. He tended the water buffaloes with utmost care for he knew that he had to keep his job or his siblings would starve. And since his father's death, their roof had not been rethatched. And every time it rained, Rupak had to scurry about replacing placing stone jars beneath the gaping holes to catch the rainwater. Bala was only six years old, but had to learn to cook, care for her baby sister, and gather firewood for the forest. Though just a small child, she would knead flour into cha chapati bread for her siblings to eat. Rarely could they buy even a bit of curry powder. When Savasti led the buffaloes back to their stable, the tantalizing fragrance of curry drifted from Rambol's kitchen, made his mouth water. Chabati dipped in curry sauce cooked with meat had been an unknown luxury since his father died. The children's clothes were little more than rags and Savasti owned but one worn dhati. When it was cold, he wrapped an old brown cloth around his shoulders. It was threadbare and faded, but precious to him nonetheless. Savasti had to find good grazing spots for the buffaloes, for if he returned them to their stable hungry, he knew he would be beaten by Mr. Rambul. In addition, he had to carry home a sizable bundle of grass every evening for the buffaloes to eat throughout the night. One, on evenings, when the mosquitoes were thick, Savasti lit a fire to chase them away with the smoke. Rambo paid him in rice, flour, and salt every three days. Some days, Savasti was able to bring home a new fish that he had caught along the edges of the Naranja River for Bhima to cook. One afternoon, after he had bathed the buffaloes and cut a bushel of grass, Savasti felt like spending a quiet moment alone in the cool forest. Leaving the buffaloes grazing at the forest edge, Savasti looked about for a tall tree to, to rest against, and suddenly he stopped. There was a man sitting silently beneath a papala tree, no more than 20 feet away. Savasti gazed at him in wonder. He had never before seen anyone sit so beautifully. The man's back was perfectly straight, and his feet rested elegantly upon his thighs. 
He held himself with utmost stability and inner purpose. His eyes appeared to be half closed and his folded hands rested lightly on his lap. He wore a faded yellow robe, which left one shoulder bare and his body radiated peace, serenity, and majesty. Just one look at him and Savasti felt wondrously refreshed. His heart trembled. He did not understand how he could feel something so special for a person he hadn't even met, but he stood immobile in utter respect for a long moment. Then the man opened his eyes. He did not see Savasti at first. As he uncrossed his legs and gently massaged his ankles and the soles of his feet, slowly he stood up. That made me think of Lama when he gets out of his chair, you know, because his knees aren't so good. However, I just have to say, he says he doesn't suffer, and I'm going to believe that. <laughs> Slowly, he stood up and began to walk. Because he walked in the opposite direction, he still did not see Savasti. Without making a sound, Savasti watched the man take slow, meditative steps along the forest floor. After seven or eight such steps, the man turned around, and it was then that he noticed Savasti. He smiled at the boy. No one had ever smiled with such gentle tolerance at Savasti before. That's why I picked this, because that's how Lama is. As though drawn by an invisible force, Savasti ran towards the man. But when he was within a few feet, he stopped in his tracks, remembering that he had no right to approach anyone of higher caste. Savasti was an untouchable. He did not belong to any of the four social castes. His father had explained to him that the Brahma... Brahmana caste was the highest, and people born into this caste were priests and teachers who read and understood the vid vidyas. My apologies, I'm sure that's not how you say it, and other scriptures, and made offerings to the gods. When Brahma created the human race, the Brahman issued from his mouth. The, the Chatriya were the next highest case, caste. They could hold political and military positions as they had issued from Brahma's two hands. Those were the vid Vashya case were merchants, farmers, and craftspeople who had sprung from Brahma's thighs. Those of the Shudra case had come from Brahma's feet and were the lowest of the four castes. They did, not, they, they did only the manual labor not performed by the higher castes, but Shvasti's family members were the untouchables, those who had no caste at all, and they were required to build their home outside of the village limits. And they did the lowest kinds of work, such as collecting garbage, spreading manure, digging roads, feeding pigs, and tending water buffaloes. Everyone had to accept the caste into which he or she was born. The sacred scriptures taught that happiness was the ability to accept one's position. If an untouchable like Savasti touched a person of a higher caste, he would be beaten. In the village of Ravala, an untouchable man had been beaten severely for touching a Brahmin with his hand. The Brahmin or Chatriya touched by an untouchable was considered polluted and had to return home to fast and do penance for several weeks in order to cleanse himself. Whenever Savasti led the buffaloes home, he took great pains not to pass near any person of high caste on the road to outside Rambul's house. It seemed to Savasti that even the buffalo were more fortunate than he because a Brahmin could touch a buffalo without being polluted. Even if through no fault, the untouchable, a person of higher caste, accidentally brushed against him. The untouchable could still be ruthlessly beaten. Here, before Savasti, stood a most attractive man, and it was clear from his bearing that he did not share the same social status. Surely someone with so kind and tolerant a smile would not beat Savasti, even if he did touch him. But Savasti did not want to be the cause of pollution of someone so special, and that was why he froze when he and the man were a few steps apart. Seeing Savasti's hesitation, the man stepped forward himself. Savasti stepped back to avoid coming into contact with the man, but the man was quicker, and in the blink of an eye, had grasped Savasti by the shoulder with his left hand. And with his right hand, he gave Savasti a tender pat on the head. And Savasti stood motionless. No one had ever touched him on the head in so gentle and an affectionate way, and yet he felt suddenly panic-stricken. Don't be afraid, the man said in a quiet, reassuring voice. At the sound of that voice, Sebasti's fears disappeared, and he lifted his head and gazed at the man's kind and tolerant smile. And after hesitating for a moment, he stammered, Sir, I like you very much. And the man lifted Sebasti's chin in his hand and looked into the boy's eyes, and I like you also. Sebasti did not answer. Oh, he said, he asked him, do you live nearby? And Sebasti did not answer. He took the man's left hand in his own two hands and asked the question that was troubling him. When I touch you, 
Aren't you being polluted? And the man laughed and he shook his head. Not at all. You are a human being and I'm a human being. You can't pollute me. Don't listen to what people tell you. And he took Sebastian's hand and walked him to the edge of the forest. And the water buffaloes were still grazing peacefully. And the man looked at Sebastian and asked, do you tend these buffaloes? And that must be the grass you've cut for their dinner. What is your name? Is your house nearby? Shabasti answered politely, yes, sir, I care for these four buffaloes and that one calf, and that is the grass I cut, and my name is Sebasti, and I live on the other side of the river, just beyond the village of Uvela. Please, sir, what is your name, and where do you live? Can you tell me? And the man answered, certainly, my name is Siddhartha, and my home is far away, but at present, I'm living in this forest. Are you a hermit? And sir Siddhartha nodded. Sebastian knew that hermits were men who usually lived and meditated up in the mountains. Though they had just met and exchanged no more than a few words, Sebastian felt a warm bond with his new friend. In Ervella, no one ever treated him in so friendly a way or spoke to him with such warmth, and a great happiness surged within him, and he wanted to somehow express this joy. If only he had some gift he could offer Siddhartha, but there was no penny in his pocket, and even a piece of sugar cane or rock candy what could he offer? He had nothing, but he summoned the courage to say, Mister, I wish I could give you a gift, but I have nothing. And Siddhartha looked at Savati and smiled, but you do. You have something I would like very much. I do. Siddhartha pointed to the pile of kusha grass. That grass you have cut for the buffaloes is soft and fragrant. And if you could give me a few handfuls, I shall make a sitting cushion for my meditation beneath the tree. And that would make me very happy. Shabachi's eyes shone and he ran to a pile of grass, gathered a large bundle in his thin arms and offered it, offered it to Siddhartha. I just cut this grass down by the river. Please accept it. I can easily cut more for the buffaloes. Siddhartha placed his hands together like a lotus bud and accepted the gift and he said, you are a very kind boy and I thank you. Go and cut some more grass for your buffaloes before it grows too late. And if you have a chance, please come and see me tomorrow afternoon in the forest again. Young Savasti bowed his head in farewell and stood watching as Siddhartha disappeared back into the forest. And then he picked up his sickle and headed for the shore and his heart filled with the warmest of feelings. It was early autumn. The kusha grass was still soft and his sickle was new, newly sharpened. And it wasn't long at all before Savasti had cut another large armful of kusha grass. Sebasti led the buffaloes to Rumble's home, guiding them to cross a shallow section of the Naranjara, Naranjara River. And the calf was reluctant to leave the sweet grass along the shore. And Sebasti had to coax her along. The bushel of grass on his shoulder was not heavy. And Sebasti waded across the river together with the buffaloes. Okay. So that, <laughs> that was one chapter and Every chapter is like that. And you can see I kind of hurt, I've kind of, I've kind of read this book a little bit. <laughs> but, um, so I, I chose, I chose that story. However, there is stories about the Buddha's birth and the Buddha's parinirvana and the birth Buddha's, and the Buddha's, uh, Buddha's death, which all the stories, uh, the reason I chose that one is because I've seen, uh, I've seen Lamala. Uh, treat people that maybe life is kind of forgotten or my, maybe life, uh, you know, maybe they've forgotten themselves and he's treated them, you know, well, well, I'll just use myself. I mean, part of my childhood, I grew up in the back of a gas station. I don't, some of you might not know, but Lama grew up in a very affluent way. So, you know, he, typically those kind of worlds don't cross paths, you know, so we want our sangha to kind of reflect the world as it is, which means people that grow up rather in an affluent way, people that kind of on the edge of life, people that um, maybe we wouldn't normally hang with, and we all come together with understanding that we're all with. We start with the idea of complete equanimity, you know, without no high, no no above, no below, and of course we have differences. So it takes time to get to know people that come from such different walks of life. But that's our first step, and then after that, we uh, we start to uh, you know come here and uh, 
get to know each other because you know sometimes uh, it's a mistake I made at the beginning I I just mainly I just got to know Lama you know I let him know me and then I didn't get to know all of you and it's only in the past couple of years where I started to recognize you know I mean without that this is a very critical piece missing that uh, Sangha we need Sangha and and Lama can tell when we're unbalanced and you know, then, then he might put you in charge of a group <laughs> or something like that. That's what he definitely will do. He'll put you in charge of a group or all sorts of different. You think, how did he know that would get me? <laughs> it's maybe not hard to figure out. But in any way, um, I, I, I don't have a big talk prepared. I, my apologies about that. I, I just thought, well, what can I do? It's with such little notice. And I didn't want to uh, just, uh, you know, uh, take up people's time with a bunch of words of my own that, you know, sometimes I feel like I might do that. Couldn't. Instead, I wanted to give you words of somebody that we can all look to for inspiration and, and for help. Like, I don't know everybody listening's background, but there's some of us sometimes is, we're kind of, we arrive here in a trauma place and we're kind of in a deep hole, some of us. And every, we're all in different places, but I've come along the way to discover that everybody in a different way is a little bit fragile, even if they appear quite confident. Below, beneath that, there's their own fragility. It might not be as evident, but it's there. And then if we, as we get stronger, hopefully we don't forget where we come from. We can use that for compassion to reach out beyond ourselves and say, oh, I understand. And they'll believe us. They'll believe us. And that's invaluable. So for that reason, I don't regret anything. It, it's so amazing. All the things that have happened to me along the way that the most difficult things have turned into what Lama calls my jewels because, uh, because they've turned into compassion because i not not feeling sorry for someone compassion because that's uh, one thing uh, that I didn't rec recognize. That's what I uh, tend to do. That doesn't help. Instead, the kind of compassion where you're like, you know, inside of you is a jewel too. So. Anyway, um, so that is my talk for today, <laughs> but um, I just want to open it up. And uh, actually, I, I would like to make sure we have some time to kind of highlight next weekend because uh, that is really, uh, really fun. <laughs> it's not just, it's, it's we're going to do, uh, our, well, I don't want to say too much because I've got some friends here that know exactly what that's going to happen. Um, but before I open it up to Autumn and, and perhaps Susan, um, does anybody here uh, like to say anything about what I've talked about? Or... Oh, oh, uh, maybe we could use that one. Bradley, can, can you share that one around if there anybody? That's, yeah, and I, I sh maybe you should put that away for me. So I don't... Yes. No, I just want to um, sound like it is. It takes a minute. Yeah. It's working. Is it? It's oh, I guess it is now. <laughs> anyway, I just want to thank you, Patty. To me, that is like the most fabulous book. It's so beautifully written. And I think Nat Han was one of my favorite teachers. And I think that story, what made me think of is how we need to be aware that, um, first of all, Savasti was frightened a little bit to do that, to reach out mm -hmm. to this person. And I think sometimes we may be a bit hesitant or frightened to someone we think is maybe a greater spiritual person or greater uh, evolved. Mm -hmm. But by making that gesture is very, very important. And then to remember that a small gift, a small giving, because you want to give something. And I think that's what that story points out. Savasti really wanted to give something, didn't think he had anything of value, but that wasn't the point was that whatever he could give was so greatly appreciated and um, helped him grow you know as a person so i just want to thank you for that wonderful story and and i do hope everyone buys the book and reads the rest of it yeah. but thanks for that it was great to hear you yeah thank you for your talk that's one of my the first books that i actually read coming oh. here and now I want to read it again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it really reminds me about how important knowing the cultural context of a situation is mm -hmm. when you're studying these 
whole story because you know sometimes you hear these things uh, these stories the abbreviated version where it's like a little boy saw buddha in the forest and, and loved him so and followed him the rest of his life right but without knowing the backstory like the fact that they reached out and touched one another is hugely significant in that context and it reminds me of a story that I heard in a uh, women and fe feminism, no, I'm sorry, world religion, feminism and world religions class that I took in college. And the teacher talked about Jesus and the story about how these women came and washed his feet. But in the culture um, of that time, washing someone's feet was a symbol of being a student of that person. And so by Jesus allowing a woman to wash his feet, saying this person is a student, in that culture was not allowed. So if you don't know the significance of the culture of the time, then it's hard to really understand the meaning of the story. So I, I didn't I didn't know that part of the story. And I think that is that just a really good example. Yeah, it's yeah. neat, isn't it? I love learning about these things. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Like, uh, you know, that um, compassion is, is vastly different than, you know, having pity for somebody, you know. That's why that starting with equanimity um, is so important. Oh, I, I am not using my microphone properly. My voice is super soft. So, um, so yeah, because uh, during those times and even today, uh, these this caste system, um, we all we have this caste system here too. You know, in a certain sense, like who we're willing to hang out with or get to know as friends and. It's understandable, really, because we just are one just not in touch with each other. But um, but just I just like that story because um, it just it just was that there's lots of reasons, but one of them is that that acknowledgement that I just thought was so moving because for those times and even today, you know, just uh, seeing recognizing the inherent value of whomever. That's what that, that's what I take away from it. So um, so I. And I just wanted to say a little bit, uh, just a, a final word about what I did yesterday um, when I went to this particular center, because uh, that particular uh, experience was reminding me, um, for, well, the reason I went to it is because, it's because it was all the, I don't, it's a teaching actually, it's called an empowerment, which I don't really want to, I'm not qualified to really explain too much about that, but it's just about that quality of open heartedness, you know, and that's what I think this whole month is about open heartedness to, to life, you know, whatever we do, they, they say this month, they'll say, that if you read online about um, this particular month, they'll talk about everything you do is multiplied by a million, you know, so uh, we, that just, we should always be thinking like that 12 months of the year, to be honest. But if we just want to kind of think of it this month, we can think of it not just doing, you know, our prayers, which I think really are helpful, but but just whatever interaction we have, we can just be a little bit more mindful about it. We'll have a better day and everyone around us will too. So anyway, 
Is there any, any more questions? Is there any, any question or comment online or anything? I'm not able to, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a computer. Thank you, Patty, it's Roberta. Oh, Roberta, Roberta's there, oh my goodness. Oh, Roberta, you're there, I can't believe it. I, I'm unable to see, but uh, is it possible uh, to see the chat? Could you tell us uh, what Roberta or? To oh. Okay, so friends, if, if you would like to make a comment, there's no pressure, but if you if you like to, I'll give you a, a minute or two if anybody wants to uh, give a comment, you can just um, unmute yourself. Otherwise, I'm going to... Um... Oh. Okay. So, she, so, she, so she's not talking and that's no problem. I'm so glad she's here. So um, thank you for your thank you for your talk. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Oh, I I don't. I just I'm not. I can't. I don't have my glasses on and I can't see. And I'm like they're saying we're bird. And I'm like, oh, she want to say. So I'm sorry if I put undue pressure on anybody. <laughs> so um okay so 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 do we do announcements after closing prayers or do we typically do them first? Yeah. So we'll. We'll do closing prayers and then we'll have some announcements about next week. Okay. All right, so we'll do um, dedication prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of the Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezi, Chenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. And may the upholder of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losang, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasury of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the hosts of most of Mars. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy lands of sages. Losang Drapa, I make requests at your holy feet. Are there any announcements? Oh, so next weekend is the Sakadawa celebration on Sunday. We're going to have food. We're going to have some ceremony and some beautiful flowers and a refuge, small refuge ceremony, and um, some visiting teachers, Geshe Yamcho will be here. So it's gonna be a beautiful weekend. Please come join. And if you'd like to um, bring food, we have a couple people uh, putting that together, speak with Jules or Kathy M or myself, if you wanna bring food, which I highly recommend bringing food. Um, if you wanna come early and help set up, uh, let me know. I've got a list going. And that is all. Yep. Okay. I think so. Is anybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice time for children, you know, the bathing of the Buddha. So recommend bringing the kids. Um, so, so also uh, on Wednesday, um, we're going to have a Geshe Damcho lead uh, medicine, a special medicine Buddha practice, because like I was mentioning, we, we consider all things multiplied this month. And so uh, there's a lot of people needing our prayers and Geshe Damcho has said that he'd come and, and lead us in meditation. And that'll be at six o'clock on Wednesdays. That's normally a meditation time. 
um, as we normally uh, come together to meditate. So if people, maybe they don't get this message and they just show up, I think they won't be sorry because it'll be just wonderful, you know, to be with Geshe Damcho. And we will meditate and do prayer. So Medicine Buddha. You know, I, I don't know, Doug, but I whatever we do, Geshe Damcho will lead us and I think it'll be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Doug is asking me uh, how long I anticipate the practice to be. I'm imagining it'll be about an hour. So that's usually. Okay, thank you, Doug. So um, everyone, I wish you a nice day. It rained a little here. I don't know where it's what it's like where you are, but it's been such a beautiful morning and I wish you a peaceful, nice rest of your day. See everybody next week. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Patty. It was great, Patty. I loved it. Thanks, everybody. We're in it together, aren't we?